Good evening. Namaskar. Um, I must first of all thank you very much for uh, <coughs> taking your time on this wet day to come to the auditorium to listen to a talk on careers in astronomy. So because uh, I may be talking about something which doesn't exist at all. Right? So, the, so you are taking particular trouble to come to it. Uh, now, uh, this is going to be a talk on astronomy, but there are no astronomical pictures. Right? I mean, at one point you will see half a image of, uh, of Neptune. Uh, that's only because I couldn't get rid of it. Right? So I am not going to talk about astronomy at all, but about the process. Okay, meaning that if you want to become an astronomer, how do you go about uh, doing it? And then, uh, if you, uh, I, how long will it take you to do it? Uh, what do you find at the end of the tunnel? Right, so I'm going to do this. This is not a multimedia presentation. It is all presentation details are by definition uh, multimedia. But I'm going to make it a multi-people presentation. Right, so meaning that I thought that the words about careers in astronomy must come to you from people who are at different stages of their careers. Okay, like I am at a particular stage, uh, meaning I am on my way out. Many people would have liked me a long time ago. Uh, but I managed to stick on. And I just not uh, that's coming to them. Uh, then, uh, there are people who are just coming in. Uh, people who are, uh, so there is a part one, part two, part three, part four. So part four is what we are hearing now. Uh, part one, part two, and part three uh, will, will soon be heard. And then there is a part, Three prime, okay, which also will be something quite different. Right, so the, then uh, there can of course be questions and answers, and you can ask us whatever you like. So first, I think that we'll get um, over with all the presentations or talks or discussions, and after that, you can ask the questions. Right. So let me begin with this one. And uh, you're all young people, and uh, you all be uh, aspiring to different successful careers. So this is one possible career. I mean, in this season, for example, you will find that there are all these shows which are put on and different, uh, different councillors come, and then there are different uh, companies which are doing it. So this is some kind of a show like that, because you really, really like to attract young people. But uh, unlike PCS or Infosys, uh, our goal is to have, not to have 100,000 people. But one good person would be enough. Uh, five people would be great. About 10 persons per year are absolutely essential. Right? So that's what so you like to inspire your people to do. So the careers in astronomy and fashion of fiction. So the, that is for you to decide, uh, but we'll move forward and we'll see what is possible. So first of all, pictures of astronomers. So because you know when people like to show you, uh, like the, when there are these things about IIM graduates, not, uh, not IIM graduates, but management studies. So you will always find uh, uh, that the boys will be in t-shirts and the women will always be in suits and so on. So nobody in India wears any other dress, okay, because they need to go forward. So similarly, astronomers also have a uniform. So if you become an astronomer, you look like this. <laughs> or rather, uh, uh, so you would have looked like this in the 17th century. So this is the, you must have heard about Berger. He's a very famous Dutch painter. And uh, what he did was that his paintings were very evocative. And so meaning that there's a great story in them. So you will see the astronomy here looking at uh, the celestial globe as people are aware of it. And then you see the window and a light is coming from the window and illuminating the person and then the sundial the, or the cupboard. There are all sorts of things which happen. And so the pictures are very, they're very fine. Is very high art, but also they're very evocative. Right, so then you uh, jump to the 19th century, September 23, 1846. Uh, that was the time when Neptune was actually observed. So these are three contemporary mathematicians and astronomers. Uh, many of you might know the story. Uh, it was uh, John Couch Adams, was a mathematician, uh, who, who looked at the orbit of Uranus, which had been discovered some years before that. Uh, and then apparently one whole orbit of Uranus was completed. And then there are perturbations which could not be explained and who said that uh, there will be a new planet, the eighth planet, now that we know <coughs> the last planet. And he said that you point your telescope in this direction and there are new planet. planet. Now you know <coughs> the French mathematicians. 
Asia did the same calculation, more or less at the same time. Uh, but they actually predicted where the planet would be. Uh, you have gone, I believe, him, look at it and found the chief. Okay, so these are astronomers who were reasonably young at the time, and uh, that is how you would have looked like in the 19th century. Okay, but what about the end of the 20th century or the beginning of the 21st century? <laughs> okay, so these guys, again, I mean, the story is the same. Okay, they are not trying to discover a black hole in a galaxy at Z is equal to 15, nothing like that. They are looking for the 10th planet. Now, this is a point which is completely missed in India. Okay, is that looking for things in our own backyard, um, planets in the solar system, planets just outside the solar system, and how exciting that is. That shows that these people, I mean, they, they thought that they discovered the 10th planet. Um, now, it will be called the 9th planet. In fact, because they thought that the 10th planet, Pluto lost its role in the planet. Right, so you see that the guy is eating oysters. Um, and then uh, uh, there is this uh, person here who is probably playing something, some instrument. Right, and here somebody is sending email. So, so you see that when you become astronomers, you are more likely to do like this uh, than the Vermeer's paintings. So you can be reasonably assured uh, that you will not require a great dress change. Right. So then, uh, what do astronomers work on? It's a theory. Uh, so we every year we get new graduate students, and then uh, every year I call them, and then I talk to them and say, "What would you like to work on?" Theory. So they all work, want to work on cosmology. Some person here or there wants to work on black holes. Then, the, uh, apart from these two, there's only quantum gravity. So I always tell them that look, there's all kinds of exciting things, uh, planets, uh, asteroids. But I mean, they just listen to it and walk out. And when they are walking down the staircase, I hear them laughing loudly. <laughs> right? So theory is very important. Uh, we do quite a lot of uh, uh, theory uh, here, and uh, we started off as an institute of theory, but subsequently we have also taken to other branches, other uh, ways of doing astronomy. In theory, you have got cosmology, then you have got the nature of astrophysics. It is always very exciting. Occasionally, theory leads experiment at other times. Uh, the observations throw up new objects, and then the theory has been there. And most famous of that, which happened in the 1960s, at the top, in the beginning of the 1960s, quasars were discovered. And nobody knew what they were looking at. But in the middle of the 1960s, uh, they discovered pulsars. Right, so, and again, nobody knew what they were looking at, except that neutron stars had already been predicted. Uh, the only thing that they have not got right was that if there's a neutron star, an object for neutron star, then it must be spinning rapidly and it must have a magnetic field. Right, so uh, they had missed that. So you, you observe an object and then you start. It. Then you have got observations and about instrumentation. So what I'm going to do today, is that, I mean, I could have gone into the theory because that is how I started my life. Uh, but uh, I'm going to be talking about observational facilities, instrumentation facilities, because that is where the change comes from. Right? So, so I'm going to concentrate on that. So now, there is a subject called astronomy. <coughs> so what do you depend on? And how do you become an astronomer? I mean, I always get these eight-year-old kids, fathers of eight-year-old children coming to me and saying that it's very interesting in astronomy. Where should we start? So I said that, Retirement that is the charge for Chandras. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, the, so you don't start poor. You take your time, the fullness of time, everything will happen. So now when you talk of astronomy, uh, you've got physics, you've got mathematics, you've got statistics. I mean, these are the subjects which are absolutely essential. Okay, so I mean, there are again people who come and say, all sorts of things, we don't know physics, we don't know mathematics, that we do, we can definitely do it. Okay, but if you, uh, uh, like, like for example, uh, if you want to be a driver, you need to know uh, how to drive a car. I mean, in India, uh, every morning we provide proof, concrete proof of the fact that you don't need to learn to drive in order to drive. <laughs> okay, so, but on the other hand, uh, uh, in astronomy, it's necessary to have these apparatus. So in physics, mathematics, statistics, so I have no illusion. <coughs> but then, uh, when we are talking about observation, we are talking about instrumentation. So you have got engineering, and then you have got technology which is coming in, 
and then I put instrumentation separately. Uh, it is not really separate because it comes from engineering technology and astronomy, uh, but it is something which is very important in its own right. So when you build a large telescope, you require very large instruments. So it's a completely different scale. And for example, uh, if you look at the TMP, which is a very large telescope, uh, then the size of the instruments will be the size of the strain up to the ceiling and so on. So that is a completely different ballgame. So it, it is not just a small little application that you make it. So it is very complete. OK, then, of course, uh, you've got the computers making a, 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 let's say, contribution to astronomy. So you've got the software technology. So you've got new languages coming in, new ways of writing codes, uh, some of which actually have been discovered by astronomers. OK, then, uh, <coughs> then you've got, uh, uh, I mean, you, you, uh, you get, invent things like the internet. You've got to draw the data. Then you've got big data. And uh, big data is a very big thing these days. Uh, I recently wrote a proposal for big data, but the person who asked me to write the proposal said, please don't say big data. It is too common. <laughs> so but big data is there. How to manage it, how to do it. It, it takes on its own life. OK, like instruments take on their own life. When data volumes become large, they actually become alive. And then they have got the data analytics. I really don't know what it means. It sounds <laughs> okay. And then it clearly has something to do with these things. That's what it means that, I would call it data mining. Okay, if there is a lot of data, how do I draw information from it? Right? And then you have got the high performance computing, which is again a very big thing. Uh, we have got really good high performance computing there at Ayuka. Several other people also have it. And uh, to get the computers going, to manage them, uh, then to use them, uh, is completely inescapable, also very difficult. So these are all challenges which are found in the space. Now, I, I, what I wanted to do, which I'll do the next time I give this talk, this is a fresh talk actually, I've not given it before, uh, is that um, all the arrows can be reversed. Right? So that is the point in careers in astronomy. So if you become an astronomer, if you do your PhD, okay, it does not mean that you get a job uh, in astronomy or your job is. You see that you can enter any one of these. You can be an astronomer, you can become a statistician, you can become a, a mathematician, right? But then you can get into engineering, you can build fantastic instruments, or you can make real, real contributions to software technology. So if you actually uh, get a PhD from Ayuka or from NCRI, I mean, this is true with the other institutes in the country also, but it is specifically true with Ayuka and NCRI that any number of people will say, Please come and join our company for a very fine software job. Okay, so now software companies are also getting into astronomy. Okay, they are getting into all kinds of other very high sciences. Okay, for which they require a great deal of domain expertise. And then you should not even for one moment imagine uh, that if you actually stop working on the sun and the moon, uh, your life will become non-interesting. Okay, so because you will have domain expertise, you have a very sharp, uh, let us say, training. OK, you can use all that to do many, many, very interesting things. So please keep that in mind. Uh, and if your parents don't listen to you, tell them about that. Okay? <laughs> a software company, what is that called? Placement. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you see that these are all exciting professions. You are in the 21st century. And you really want to serve for the top of the day. Right? So I can do that in many different ways. <coughs> so how do you become an astronomer? <coughs> First, undergraduate studies. <coughs> um, I mean, you need to pass, you need to do well. OK, you need to get good marks. Uh, that does not mean that if you don't get good marks, you cannot do astronomy. The point is that when we get a housing applications, how do we shop this? OK, how do we save people? Who's good? Who's bad? And what we are looking for, we are looking for reliability. Okay, we are looking for sustainability. And we are looking for people who can work in difficult circumstances. Okay, then of course we are looking for creative people. But without reliability, without sustainability, without the ability to face adversity, there is absolutely no way in which they create. Right? Because there is no opportunity to be created. I mean, you suddenly get this thought there, you are sitting in a patent office, and then you say, hey, space time, I think, 
That's possible. Okay, but that is not the way it is systematically built. Right? right? So, uh, so then you, you have to do well in undergraduate studies, and then there are postgraduate studies, and then there are doctoral studies. So, uh, and, and you can you can finish your PhD and straight go to doctoral studies. And I know people who have done that, I know people who are still doing it. But, but these are different ways of doing it. Okay, so you've got a BSc, uh, then you've got, you can have a B, you can have an MSc, B with BE, BTEC, whatever. Okay, and then uh, uh, you need physics and maths in the MSc. There are all kinds of exceptions. Right, but here what we are talking about is the rule. Right, and then after that doctoral study, you have got postdoctoral work, and then you can join the faculty, you can become a staff scientist. What do you mean by staff scientist? Is that you could be working on a very great telescope. Okay, so you'll be doing telescope related work, you'll be doing research on the side. But you have a faculty, typically um, in India, you mean you belong to one of the institutes or the universities. Right, so when does this happen? Let's say that you are age 22 when you finish your BE or when you finish your MSc, and age 27 when you finish your PhD, and age 30 uh, when you uh, uh, finish your postdoctoral work and look for a job. Then, so it is going to be a long haul. But things will happen, because it's very good. But you don't imagine for a moment that it is going to be two years in. And so that you have to be prepared for. So you have to take reality into question. And uh, if, your, um, if your circumstances are such that there are people who rather if you go on a faster career, you must really take all that into account. Okay, because exactly. And then down by the where do astronomers work in that I think that this is a this is not a good place for me to ask this question because you all of you already know the answer, isn't it? Because today as I say, uh, we were talking to some people this morning and I said that uh, Pune has got a lot of uh, amateur astronomers. Okay, so then, um, then, then I thought that Pune probably uh, can go as a capital of amateur astronomy. Okay, then, then I said that Pune could also aspire to be the capital of amateur astronomy in the world. Only one problem: uh, amateur astronomers in Pune don't talk to each other. So where does one do this? Uh, it is in the institutes and in the universities. So institutes, okay? So the, the, this is Ayuka, you know it's next door. Uh, to my right is Ayuka, to my left is Ayuka. <coughs> so it can, it is very rarely possible. I, mean, I don't know any other uh, place in the world uh, where you can just get onto a bicycle or get into a bus uh, and come to one point inside the Pune University where uh, three of the biggest projects in the world now are being worked on. Okay? There's the TMT, uh, there is the LIGO, and there is the SKE. Right? And then there is AstroSat, there is Aditya, there's so many things going on. So this is simply not possible anywhere else in the world. That's what, therefore, uh, you must take advantage of it. Right? So no, take advantage of it, meaning not everybody take a job in this but it is just that when such big things are happening, they should inspire you, to, to, they should elevate you, so that whatever you do would be in a manner which is much better than it would have been if you are not in such a place. Okay, on the other hand, you could take the attitude, some author in Shalva, I look up, standing outside my name. Um, that's also possible, but, right. so this is the TR, TR for Mumbai, and um, they have had very really large astronomy groups uh, and they, uh, they do all kinds of astronomy, they do uh, X-ray astronomy, infrared astronomy, radio astronomy and many of us have our origins there and HCRA is the TRF Right, so it's, uh, it's really big. And then uh, the Raman Research Institute in Bangalore, okay, so where uh, it's very famous, all kinds of things are done there. Astronomy is just a small part of it, but we have been with um, excellent. Right, then the Indian Institute of Astrophysics in Bangalore. Uh, they have all uh, many telescopes in the south, in the north, and uh, they are our very close partners in uh, in the TMA project. Okay, we do quite a lot of work together. And then, uh, if you join any one of these institutes, you'll have a lot to do with all the other institutes. If you join Ayuka, in addition to the institutes, you'll also be working in the universities. 
right? So it gives you, it's, it's a bit nice thing. You've traveled all over the uh, Now this is Aries and Manita. Again, they are also our partners in the KFT project. They have got these telescopes. Uh, these are all small telescopes that we see, uh, but now they are building a very large telescope in Devastal, 3.6 meter, which is more or less big. So you should see first light uh, pretty soon. So you see that these are big institutes uh, in which you do all kinds of observation, theory, instrumentation. There are people working in other subjects as well. Uh, and go. But the recent level, okay, where um, you have got the ICERs, right? so there are, uh, how many ICERs are there? Five. 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 There's a new one in Tirupati. Okay, so which is <coughs> mentored by the ICER component. Uh, so it, it, every time you look at it, there will be one. Okay, so what it means is that uh, you have got uh, very many new opportunities. Right, so there are, every ICER has, uh, some have few, some have several, some have a few, some have several uh, solids. Okay, so there are, uh, actually this group is growing and that has provided career opportunities to many, many young people. Right, and then the universities, uh, there are, uh, there are famous universities, like, uh, like if you go to Delhi, there are uh, quite a lot of astronomers. Uh, then uh, uh, Calcutta University has them, Jagannath University has them. Uh, there are so many of them, Jamia Milia, uh, there are many, many universities. Uh, have them. And even small universities have a few departments. So if you look at the Shelter University, for example, which has produced quite a few. Gorakhpur, University of Gorakhpur. Uh, so we have uh, one faculty member and many students. Right, so then there are the NITs, IITs have a strong So it is a growing thing. The colleges, I forgot to mention the colleges. Uh, if you go to Delhi and go to the colleges, that's where they have astronomers. Calcutta colleges have astronomers. In Kerala, can you go to a rubber plantation, suddenly there is a small college there, and somebody will be doing their work. Right, so the, uh, there are many, many different avenues uh, which are possible. So then, now, uh, what are the observing facilities? I mean, I. I should start first start with what are the theoretical facilities, where do people do that, what are the computing facilities. Okay, so, uh, but I skipped that and I just got the lack of time and then there is uh, just observing facilities. The most famous of course is just 100 kilometers from here, uh, the GMRT in Narayanga, it's owned by the institute. Um, and CRA is a very great uh, instrument. And before that, uh, there were of course the Puti radio telescope and this has been uh, real, real achievement. Okay, so because it's setting up and more than half the time is used by uh, the world community. Right, so this is the Venubapu 2.3 meter telescope, which is uh, probably the first telescope that I saw. Uh, and uh, it is in a Sandu forest. And uh, because this is what's called a Virapan telescope. <laughs> so that there is, uh, this is a very, very exotic place. Okay, then, the same institute, the Indian School of Astrophysics, has the Himalayan Chandra Telescope uh, in Hanji. So now this particular site is rapidly developing into a big telescope set. Okay, because you've got things, you've got Kamari telescopes, you've got all sorts of things happening there. And uh, we may even put small robotic telescopes there to work on transits. Then our own Giraudis. Uh, and then uh, this is the ADS, ADS 3.6 meters. Okay, so the, this is the, the, the optical VR infrared telescope as usual, and then uh, this is the dome which is there. I think uh, for some reason they don't have good, nice pictures of it yet. We are easily available. Uh, this telescope is going to become available for observation quite soon. Okay, so uh, you see that the possibility is very exciting. Now I talked about telescopes in India. Now, this is not actually a telescope in India, it is then in South Africa, the South, Southern African Last Telescope, but Ayuka actually partly owns it. Okay, so, and then anyone who is had anything to do with Ayuka, meaning all the Ayuka members, uh, plus any astronomer, aspiring astronomer from universities, from the colleges. So supposing you've got, when you take somebody from Ferguson College or whatever college from here, and if you like, you can take time. But what you need to do is to write a proper proposal, and if you consider that, all people from the university sector can get tagged. This is a marvelous telescope. Um, it is the equivalent of a 10 meter telescope, which is a segmented meter telescope, very advanced. Okay, so um, in principle, it is as big as it can. Performance wise, because of certain restrictions, it's 
by effective diameter and it's smaller. Okay, now here there is something which is not a telescope. This is a Palomar 60 inch, uh, which is a very famous telescope on Mount Palomar. It's not ours. But I'm showing this because the instrument that you see, you see Robo AO on the way out. So that is a robotic uh, adoptive optic system which was built in Ayurveda. It was built in collaboration by Ayurveda and Ayurveda and Caltech. And you can do, it, it was the first system where the adoptive optic is generally extremely expensive. Now this was done with just by commodities of the street. And it is very, uh, in, quite inexpensive. And this is a marvelous example of building a major instrument in the laboratory, shipping it abroad, it sits there, and lots and lots and lots of people are using it. Okay, so uh, success only for the uh, instrumentation. Now this is another picture of uh, Roboeo, and I think it's just going to be. Right, uh, now can an Indian astronomer use observing facilities abroad? Uh, indeed, yes, there will be a thing. And many people here, particularly Professor Kriyana and his group, uh, they get lots of time to this. Okay, so it is possible for them to apply time. Sometimes the facilities, like the Chandra X-ray Observatory, I mean anybody can apply for that. Really, you can't really outsiders can't really apply for that on it, but you do that through collaborations. So some are national facilities, some are international facilities. Then, but you can be sure uh, that good institutes will give you every access to the data. Okay, the problem would be uh, for you to find the time, to find the good uh, research from it. Okay, and then to get on it. Then future facilities. So that is where it becomes really, really uh, interesting. Okay, because at no point, I mean, there hardly ever a time like this where extremely major facilities will all come up. I mean, they are not going to come up here for tomorrow. But they are going to come up quite soon. Okay, so the, by the time the youngest of you will be doing your MSc, will be doing your uh, PhDs, when these facilities come up. Okay, so, so this is a really golden moment for astronomy and India has got a very major role to play in every single one of these uh, uh, facilities. Okay, so now to say that there are no career opportunities in astronomy will be satanistic. Right, so near future. Okay, near future meaning when? September. I don't know I don't know the exact date in September, but it is September, September 2015, AstroSat will go. Okay, I give the first Indian astronomy satellite, fully dedicated to astronomy. The five things there is the multi wavelength satellite and it's going to do marvelous, marvelous work. Right? And then the next decade. Uh, so uh, so that would be the TMT, 30 meter telescope, and then you've got LIGO India. That's not a picture of LIGO India, that's a picture of one of the existing uh, LIGO facilities in the US. Then you've got the square kilometer array, and then you've got the Aditya L1 mission. The Aditya L1 mission is not actually formally approved, uh, but we are working on it already, a very important detector is being made here in LIGO, and it will be a solar mission. That's our astrosat. So you see that each one of these uh, labeled things, five, these are all detectors. Okay, so you've got the optical, you've got the ultraviolet, then you've got the, the X-ray detectors. And the point is that they'll all be, they, all the detectors will simultaneously point at one source and get the data from it. Which has, which has really not been possible in the past, and therefore we expect to do a very great deal. Uh, and the main USP of that is the time. Okay, the timing experiment, meaning that you look at the variability of objects and then from that you get very useful science. Uh, quite a lot of that is being done from Ayuka now. And then uh, Professor Dipanka Bhattacharya here uh, is uh, contributing very greatly to the software development. Uh, then um, there's the CZTI, the UBIT, so these are all the factors in which we have a share. And uh, we hope soon to have an AstroSat Science Center, which means that Anyone who is interested in astrocyte data can come here and learn how to analyze it uh, and can get nice results on that. Right, so this one here, uh, uh, this is what we call the Aditya L1 mission. L1 stands for the first Lagrangian point. Okay, the Earth's uh, Lagrangian point. And this mission will be flown by Israel. You go and sit there, the different detectors, 
and what is being made uh, by Ayuka by the solar astronomers and the Gates Tripathi and Professor Aprakash in the head of the instrumentation laboratory and they got lots of young people working on it there. Okay, so this is the this is the rendering of it. Okay, it still doesn't exist, but this mission may go up pretty fast. Okay, then now this is our neighbor's responsibility. Okay, the square kilometer that area. Okay, so it is going to be a great radio telescope. Um, part of it in South Africa, part of it in Australia. Start coming on street from 2020 and uh, will come to full flowering in 2024. It will have about 3,000 dishes. And so the people at NCI are working on the telescope control system of the telescope. Okay, which is again slightly ridiculous because the two big telescopes, the SK and the DFD, the people on the left side of the road are working on the SK telescope control system, people on the right hand side of the road are working on the PMT telescope control system. And so, um, so you see that, look at the data, 500 petabytes per day. We can't even store uh, the two petabytes. Right? So, so how are we going to store that? We hope that we will improve computer technology to the extent that that can be done. If it doesn't happen, what do we do? We'll see. So unless you take the risk, how can you do it? Right, so then uh, this is a 30 meter telescope. So, so you have got the American institutions, Caltech and University of California, then Canada, then Japan, then China, and then India. Okay, so until recently I have to show the different countries in different colors uh, because uh, they had agreed to be partners to different experiments. So now everybody is agreed and it's all good enough. You must have heard in the press that there's a bit of a problem there. Uh, putting the telescope on uh, the top of the mountain because some people think that the mountain is sacred and the telescope is not going there, but that's going there. That, and then, in fact, I can tell them, but they don't believe me, that these are very common situations in India. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, there are ways in which you can deal with them, you can sit down with them, you can talk to the people. Okay, and then you can come to a reasonable compromise. But I'm not a lawyer. They need lawyers to this. <laughs> so um, I have now told you about, uh, uh, let me leave it here. I told you about the facilities, but I told you about the way in which you can uh, do these things. You must, uh, I have completely avoided saying that Jess is not Okay, first of all, I don't understand the equities. Okay, but, and there are very easy ways of coming up. But what I must tell you, is that a career here is extremely complicated. It is not enough for you to be complete, you also to be competent. Okay, you have to aspire to do better than the others. You aspire to do something uh, which has not been done. Right, and then, uh, in my time, uh, there were hardly any scholarships or something. Then, um, somebody told me that there's something called a science talent exam, yeah? there was only one at the time. Uh, and then you must appear for it. So I wrote to them saying that I want to appear for it, but they wrote that same two days. Okay, because I was already in my 12th standard, it doesn't do it in the standard. Okay, but now you see that there are all kinds of things, there are five programs, uh, and it's, um, I can't remember the acronyms, but uh, there are scholarships which you can get at every stage of your student days. Okay, you can get something up to 12th standard, something up to BSc, something up to MSc. There is every possible encouragement which is available. Okay, so what you need to do is to actually study because everything is now available on web science. Okay, what we have wanted to do in Ayuka is to have a master website to go there, click on everything, check it out, everything. What I realized is that that is impossible. Okay, because things keep changing every day. But on the other hand, if you just throw the internet a little bit, okay, then you look at a few things and uh, put the right words. Or in Android, you can say the right words. Okay, you say, I don't have to tell you everything about that. So you have to work. Okay, you have to find out, and then the most important people to talk to are those who have just done this thing just a few years before. Right? Because sometimes people come and ask me which American university is it. Okay, so I said that, uh, I mean, I can hardly tell you that. What I can do is that if you ask me whether I know somebody in a particular department, where are good people working, I can take it. Okay, but which American university is good to go to now, or which Indian institute is good, okay, the, 
I mean, you really uh, should ask people who are just a little bit older. They just tell you, "Kya baat hai? Kya apna idol hai?" I mean, we are not going to tell you that. We are not going to tell you that they are all people very boring now. And uh, we don't do any research. It's just some comfort. You have to find that out by talking to the right people. Right? So please uh, look at it. Don't depend upon the music. Troll the internet. Okay? Ask people questions and make up your mind. And the opportunity is there. Right? So what I'm going to do now um, is to... Uh, uh, there are people, as I told you, um, <coughs> uh, to... Um, are in, uh, in different stages of their astronomy career. Some at the start, okay, some finish after one stage, the other stage. So I'm calling three people on the stage now. Okay, uh, Avyatana, Hamsa, and Bhavati. So uh, now uh, these three people all have different, slightly different histories. Now Avyatana is from Iser in Calcutta. Okay, actually Iser Kalyani. And then uh, she's an engineer. And so she's uh, uh, she is enrolled in ISA. She is working on solar astronomy, but now she had come to Ayurka a year ago. She is working the previous Trimati. And then, uh, so that tells you how much flexibility there is in the system. That is possible. Uh, then there is Hamsa. Uh, and many of you might know her. She is a local kid. Okay, she grew up among astronomers. When you grew up among astronomers, uh, then, um, uh, then many people don't want to be astronomers. And some say, I don't want to do astronomy, I don't want to do biology. So I try to tell him, please do astronomy. Actual children become actors. Presidents children become presidents. But I said that the first is like a bath, you have put it in Chikur. So he said, no. Um, and, um, uh, but Hamsa uh, uh, had succumbed to temptation. She is doing research. So she first started off uh, doing kid. Okay, and now she's doing more of uh, astrophysics, a combination of astrophysics and cosmology. No, Varun, uh, <coughs> I was telling you the part of the competitive. Okay, now Varun uh, is at the, uh, the, he started on the college of Olympia and then things and uh, he successful, then he went to IIT, and then from IIT, uh, he went to Canada. Okay, so uh, then he did uh, instrumentation uh, related work, observations, and also modeling in Caltech. So we have come at the postdoc. So he has been a postdoc. The first year, the Vaita Rancho did postdoc, which is a, I think we have named after two great Indian uh, relativists. Uh, and then now he's an inspired fellow, uh, and then he's looking for a job. So we are going to <laughs> uh, so, um, so I would like them to just in five minutes tell you their um, uh, stories. And after that, there will be one more item. Okay? Please. Okay, Thank you, to. Professor Kim uh, My name is Abhyatana Ghosh, and I have a degree in <coughs> bachelor's degree in physics, followed by a master's degree in engineering. Well, that is unconventional, I understand. But uh, while I was doing my BSc in physics from Lady Brimon College, Kolkata, I came across a speech by our ex, very respected ex Prime Minister, President uh, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, who passed away recently. I heard him speak somewhere. He said that the human, human flight is nothing but human creativity, mind, hum, the creativity of human mind. He also narrated an incident where he said that Lord Kelvin, whom we know that he had, he had defined the absolute scale of temperature, he had once claimed that anything that is heavier than air can't fly and can't be flown. But soon after that, like within 10 years, the Wright brothers proved that man can fly. That gave me a thought that uh, if science is the sky, then the wings are engineering and technology. And I switched to engineering. I am very fortunate that my university has this course where I could join uh, BTEC after my BSc. I did my post-BSc BTEC in radio physics and electronics from University of Calcutta followed by a master's degree. After the master's degree in engineering, I was all obviously offered jobs by IT companies, but I decided to blend my knowledge of science and technology and do something. So I joined PhD at ISER Kolkata. Soon after joining ISER Kolkata, I was fortunate enough to be given an opportunity to work in collaboration with Ayuka in, with the, under the supervision of Dr. Durgesh Tripathi and Professor A. Ramaprakash 
on two different aspects, though they are they are linked. So yes, I have two supervisors, and uh, so when I started working, and I'm very thankful to Ayuka and my seniors, the present scientific community, Professor Kim Bhavi, Dr. Uh, Dibindu Nandi of ISR Kolkata, who have like, gone out of their way and given me an opportunity to work here despite being registered in some other place. This shows that they are trying to make things flexible and adaptable for students and giving them new opportunities. And I'm, I'm one of them who got this opportunity. So when I started schooling, I came to know that I presently work on observation of sun combined with, combined with some instrumentational study, instrumentation. So when I started my work, uh, when I started schooling, I came to know that the sun is the closest star to the solar system to our earth. And we also came to know that uh, it gives us light and energy. But when I, start, when I started my PhD, I started to know the sun in a better way and today I am a friend with a star. So, yeah. So, when I started doing my PhD, I came to know that uh, the energy, when I was in, a, in college, I came to know that the energy produced in the sun is in its core. And we expect that as we go away from the sun, the temperature and the energy, the intensity, they are going to decrease. But we see that uh, when we are in the Photosphere, the sun has a temp the photosphere or the surface of the sun has a temperature of 6,000 Kelvin, whereas the atmosphere can go up to a few million Kelvin. So, what causes this? What causes the increase of temperature? What causes the transfer of mass and energy from the lower layers to the upper layers of the atmosphere? Is something I work on. What I do is with the existing facilities, with the existing space-based facilities that are there like IRAs, SDO, the Solar Observatory, the Solar Dynamic Observatory, the uh, SOHO, these are space-based missions that provide us data of the sun at different wavelengths. These, these, wavelengths are, these, these wavelengths are emitted by ions which are characteristic of the layers which are at particular temperatures. And with that data, I, I try to understand the coupling and dynamics of the solar atmosphere. Now, one question that might arise in people's mind is that why do we need to go to the space when we have ground-based observatories? As Professor Kim Bhavi had shown, uh, we have several ground-based observatories, including that of India, like the Kodai Canal uh, Solar Observatory, the Udaipur Solar Observatory. Recently, Udaipur Solar Observatory has opened a new multi-application solar telescope, which is the MAST. So uh, we need to go to the space because that provides us primarily because the sun's UV emission that is blocked by Earth's atmosphere. But if we go to this point where outside the solar atmosphere, then we can have we can study the UV emission of the sun, and secondly, from there we can have a 24/7 observations of the sun. So uh, from those. Uh, from the existing telescopes, what we get are images of the sun, which are images of the sun, which we, we can see. There are several uh, ions that are emitted, that are characteristic to the layers, the temperatures of the layers, and we study the coupling. So, uh, what are the kind of features that we see there? What are the kind of features that we see there are the active region, the quiet sun region. Active regions are, are special regions on the solar surface which have more complex and dynamic uh, magnetic field strengths. Magnetic configuration with higher magnetic field strengths and stuff like that. Uh, as compared to the quiet sun which has a less dynamic, less complex and less strong magnetic fields. So uh, these are in different wavelengths. So using this, so this covers my uh, observational studies. After this, what I do is uh, I use the existing solar satellite data to understand that how we can how we can model our upcoming telescope, which is the Solar Ultraviolet Telescope Suit, Imaging Telescope Suit, which is on board Aditya L1, as Professor Kimbabwe had mentioned, it is going to be placed at the L1 first Lagrangian point uh, between the Sun and the Earth. So uh, the instrument is this. This is the instrument and currently we are trying to build a suit which is going to be, which is being modeled, designed and built in Ayuka. I am a part of this group. So what we try to do is after the satellite is going to be in the orbit, what kind of performance is, the, is our instrument going to do? What kind of data we are going to get? How do we, how do we download that data, the pipelining, the modeling or the performance of the instrument? That is what I study. 
Apart from this, we have several other uh, payloads on the satellite, like the uh, coronagraph, which is the VLC. We have two spectrometers, the Helios one and the Solex one. This is a, a high energy, high, high energy spectrometer. This is a low energy extra spectrometer, and this is a uh, this is a plasma analyzer. So he has already explained the instruments. So this is the basic instrument that suit is that solar ultraviolet imaging telescope is. So it's a very simple optical design which we which we are going to use. But I am sure that this is going to give us images of the sun all the way from the photosphere to the upper atmosphere that is corona, <coughs> with special emphasis on two layers which have been not much studied, not stu not studied in much details. Those are the transition region and the chromosphere. So we have 11 filters and we are going to work on it. And being a student and a young citizen of India, I am very proud to be a part of it. It feels very good to realize that if this mission succeeds, which I hope it will, then I will be a part of something that has been built by India, by Indian people, and we are going to represent India on a world platform. So I am very proud and I would really want many people to join me and work hand in hand because we need many minds, many human minds, many creative human minds to go for the human flight. So, uh, Pride, I, I, I understand that there is a lot of responsibility which is involved because we are representing our nation. We are, represent, we are doing something that will be of use for the entire solar community all over the world for next decade maybe after it, is, after it goes to the orbit. So um, all I can say is we can all work together and we can all make our nation proud. Thank you. So my name is Hamsa and I am just finished my PhD here at IUCA and I'll be moving to ETH Zurich next year, early next year for a postdoctoral fellowship. So as Professor Kambali mentioned, I started out my research career by doing things which were mostly on the mathematical or theoretical side, very theoretical aspects of gravity, quantum mechanics, etc. Once I came to IUCA, I switched over to doing theory, still theory, but now theoretical astrophysics and cosmology. So these are the areas <coughs> which I currently work on at present. So to give you a very brief glimpse of the kind of things I do, this is sort of the picture we have as theoretical cosmologists of the way our entire universe evolved. As you know, cosmology is the study of our entire universe, its origin, its past, its present, also its future. So we know, for example, that the universe started out in what is known as, now known as the Big Bang. This is the only part at which we, theory is still struggling to kind of come up with an answer here. Yeah. But we all, we, from about here to here, which is today, we can actually trace the evolution of almost everything in the universe. We can trace the evolution by using very large scale, as Professor Kambavi mentioned, large scale numerical simulations. And that is especially important today because today we have a huge number of observations coming up in almost all possible parts of the electromagnetic spectrum which trace the evolution of the matter content of the universe. So, this, so as you can see, there are lots of things in the universe. There are stars and galaxies which formed around here. There is a lot of radiation here. And so basically tracing how various components of the universe evolve is very challenging and needs an interface between theory and observation. That is possible today due to the amazing technology which has been developed. And pretty much we, but the only thing is that we understand very little of our universe. So the kind of things you and I are made of, <coughs> which I will call atoms, which technically are called baryons, make up only about 5% of the universe today. And the rest of it is in what is known as dark matter and dark energy, both of which we can very, very precisely compute, but we have no understanding of their nature. We do not have laboratory evidence, and neither do we have understanding. But we can compute them, and my work essentially involves understanding the evolution of this part. This part, we know the physical processes, we know how it interacts, we know how it will evolve. We know how, for example, it interacts with radiation, 
So a question which is being asked in computational and numerical cosmology today is how did the baryons evolve over time, right? And to answer that question, you need to know how are the baryons distributed. This is sort of a schematic of how of the atoms in the universe, the kind of things we are made up of, partition themselves in today's universe. So basically we live in a stellar system, the solar system, and what the amount of atoms in stellar systems is a very, very negligible fraction of the entire atoms itself. So you have 4% and out of that less than 10%. Therefore, most of the work in this field goes into understanding the rest of the evolution of the atoms of atomic content of the universe. As you may imagine, this is a very challenging process and here is sort of a computer simulation, a numerical simulation, something which there is used to actually model each and every, almost every baryon from the time when the universe was at a very early stage all the way up to today, like I showed you in the timeline. So to do this requires very, very, very intensive facilities and at IUCA we have a fantastic high performance computing system by which we are actually able to run very high resolution simulations which actually map very, very, very intense baryonic physics and you can actually get a great handle on theory and also this enables you to compare it to the observations which are happening today because the observations also are a very, are a very precise and very accurate. So this is a little bit more technical simulation of the actual area which I work on. So this is what is known as cosmic realization. Cosmic realization is one of the ways by which the baryons actually changed their phase from completely neutral to completely ionized at a particular epoch in the universe. The exciting thing about this phase is that it is just becoming accessible to observation facilities today. So we can study it observationally. This also means that we need to model it theoretically and understand it numerically. So if you see the simulation, this is credited to Kenner, etc., who have who have made this sort of schematic as to how you can see that you know the baryons, these are all individual, these are individual galaxies which are putting out photons and ionizing the material in the universe. So to do this requires careful tracing of the temperatures and the ionization states of every single particle and that is possible because of our computing facilities. And that, that is there in uh, India and Ayurveda as well as now we are, we are now co competitive with the facilities in numerous groups abroad today in this field. Okay? Now very recently, I'd like to mention this because this is something which Professor Kembavi also alluded to. There, this reionization epoch, which is gaining a lot of importance today, is also gaining importance because it can be seen in the radio band, not just in the optical band. So basically to do a brief overview, just as you get your terrestrial radio signals in your radio, radio telescopes get you the signals from the sky, from cosmology. So you can actually start doing cosmology with the radio band with what is known as the 21 centimeter line of neutral hydrogen, right? So since radio telescopes are coming into the picture, of course there are a lot of efforts internationally to, to map the distribution of neutral hydrogen, to map how it evolves so that the observations also become very competitive, which means the theory should also become competitive enough to match these observations. That is the kind of thing I'm involved in. And to give you an overview of the kind of observations happening, we have our own GMRT, which was something again Professor Kebabi alluded to. And this is in Pune, just across. And we are also partner, India is partnered with the SCAR, the Square Kilometer Array. And besides that, there are a host of international efforts to map this. The, the evolution of the baryons in the universe and it is truly an exciting time for observational as well as numerical cosmology. Thank you very much. Um, hi, so I am Varun and uh, I am a postdoc right now at Ayuga. Uh, my journey started sitting somewhere there in the audience. I came here for Ayuga's outreach programs. Uh, the science day quiz to be precise and at that point I had a view which I hope um, at least some of you have moved beyond which is that astronomers sit at night and look at stars. Right? That is pretty much what astronomy is all about. So I did my uh, undergrad, I 
and uh, I actually ended up doing electrical engineering at IIT Bombay. From where, uh, so but before that, uh, my interest in astronomy, as I said, it began here, and it began because of Ayuka's involvement in the Olympiad program. And we have just received some uh, very good news about the Astronomy Olympiad just this week. This is the Hall of Medals that the Indian team brought in this year. We have three golds, two silvers, and we also have the best team medal. And uh, these are the guys which you are clapping for. You can see a proud Indian flag right there in Indonesia. 41 countries were present, and our performance was by far the best. So those of you who uh, you are still in say uh, 8 to 11 standard, go look up Astronomy Olympiads or you can ask us for more details and you could be here next year. Um, you might be a bit disappointed next year because India is hosting the Olympiads so instead of going abroad you will go to Bhuvaneshwar, <laughs> which is a pretty good place. So moving on, uh, after IIT I actually decided to switch back to astronomy and I went to uh, the California Institute of Technology. You might have heard this name, it's a little place called NASA. Um, we started working with NASA to build this telescope. This is called New Star, which stands for Nuclear Spectroscopic Telescope Array. It's a NASA mission which was launched in, uh, launched about three years ago, 2012. And it studies the universe in X-ray. So you've heard about radio astronomy, you've heard about optical astronomy. This thing studies the universe in X-ray. Now why am I talking about New Star? What does it have to do here? So, um, I had done my undergrad and then I had gone to integrated uh, MS PhD program and I was pretty much ready, right? I am an astronomer already. And then I was told, oh, no, 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 wait, hold on, you still have to do a postdoc. And my response was, Kaira, the shiklo ki pure sa, ki di. <laughs> Well, it turns out, my, my advisors told me and I did not believe them one bit at that point that postdoc is pretty much the most exciting phase of your career that you will have. It sounds very weird and I, as I said, I did not believe them one bit at that point, but today I completely agree. Because this is the time where I can just, you know, wear my undergrad institute t-shirt, walk up on stage suddenly and start talking with people about what I am doing. And then I can say, look, I have worked on this interesting project and the part which I really want to address now is what did I do after that. So right after my PhD, I decided to come back here. You have seen this picture already, this is AstroSat. India's first uh, astronomy <coughs> mission, what we call an observatory class satellite. This is what I started working on right after coming back. It's a fully Indian mission, a whole lot of institutes involved. You can see the list at the bottom. Uh, Professor Kimba, we already talked about this. A part which is worth emphasizing is that we are not proud about this just because it's an Indian mission. This is the thing that where we attend international conferences or when we have people coming over, they ask us, when is AstroSat going up? The date which we did not mention is 24th September of this year. This will be launched by ISRO using a PSLV from Sri Harikota. This instrument is so advanced that people all over the world are actually excited and waiting for it. This is something which we are not used to thinking about. Okay, a question which I am often asked is, wow, we were working with NASA, what is it? Because there are fantastic opportunities here. We are on par with the rest of the world. That is precisely what this is about. Right? If we are making the best in class observatories, and once this is launched, we will be working on data analysis. The instrument which I worked on was this one, the cadmium zinc telluride imager. Since I have an engineering background, I do instrumentation, instrument development, uh, which in some sense is like the job of an architect. Okay, if you are if you want to have a new house. Then as a person staying in the house, you know what you want it to be like. But most of you probably have no idea how to build a house, at least I would. And then if you are a contractor, you know how to build a house, but you have no idea what the person who will live there wants. So you need someone in between, an architect who needs to talk both the languages. Okay, that's what astronomical instrumentation people kind of do. We have a background in building stuff. We have a background in observing and using high-end instruments and telescopes and then we also act as the interface. So it's not just the people who build AstroSat who will use it. It is the entire astronomical community of India and eventually a fraction of AstroSat time will be open for the global community for use because they too are excited and looking forward. And it's not just this one particular satellite, there are a lot <coughs> of telescopes in the country. 
Okay, what this shows is in green are the radio telescopes that we have, in red are the optical telescopes, the 3.6 meter which Professor Kimbawe talked about which will hopefully be operational very soon, SALT which is uh, far out there somewhere, so the screen is not large enough to add South Africa and then of course AstroSat which is coming up in about 3 months from now. We have absolutely world class facilities and we have fantastic people who have been using them. So it's really, really fun to be working with this group. So one of the questions which has not been addressed so far is why do astronomy, right? We have talked about how to do careers in astronomy and what astronomers do. So um, each person will have a slightly different answer to this question. Um, we are advancing science, we are advancing human knowledge, we are making our country proud. My own answer really is that it's fun. Okay, a lot of my friends are very jealous with me for this. They say that when you go to office, you shouldn't call it work. Because you have just too much fun. Work is something which I should not want to go to my office at 9. I should come back home frustrated at 6 o'clock. Hopefully I can get home at least by 6 o'clock. And then I can uh, kick back and sit, relax and watch TV. In my case, it is something which is not true. I actually look forward to coming to office. And I actually have to make a... We ended up making a rule at home where I am not allowed to work at home. Because my parents and everyone started complaining, saying, you do too much astronomy already, enough. Bas. I mean, I mean, So another exciting thing that we are working on next is um, the detection of gravitational waves. So this here is a simulation of the merger of two white dwarfs. Okay, extremely compact stars. These white things which are rendered here, they don't really look white but these are, uh, as people call them, ripples in space-time. And so these white dwarfs are losing energy and at some point they are just going to bump into each other and we will have what is called a gravitational wave event. Okay, there are detectors in around the world which are uh, built to detect such events and LIGO India is proposed and will be coming up soon. These detectors work in the audio frequency. Okay, they are not listening to sound but gravitational waves of the same frequency so what they will find is roughly the same as what you can uh, fathom when you hear an airplane in the sky. So if you hear an aircraft fly over, you can say, okay, somewhere there. You don't know the color of the thing. You don't, unless you are a great expert in aircraft sounds, you don't know what model and make it work. You can probably tell the difference between a fighter jet and a commercial airplane, but that's about it. To know more about the plane, you actually have to find it in the sky, which as you know is not easy. Your eyes have a pretty wide field of view, but you still end up looking around for a while before you can see, ah, there it is. So that is the job which we are taking up. That is the robotic telescope which he alluded to, which we want to put up. We want to set up India's first fully robotic facility, which will actually go after these events and see, okay, I saw something that was exploding there in the sky. Let's get it. And again, this is somewhere where we are coordinating with the rest of the world. We are working with the best groups around the world and we are completely at the forefront of this research right now. So in summary again, the reason for being an astronomer really, the reason for coming back is it's awesome. Thanks. So uh, uh, now, uh, what I've asked him to do is to not describe his work in astronomy, uh, but he is very deeply into software technology. Again, he, he does very much uh, in the, all ways of computing, the great effort of many languages. So he spends quite a lot of time in helping people to do these things or doing talks and things like Python. So I've asked him to concentrate on that particular aspect of it. But before he begins, I just want to say a couple of things more. Okay, one is that I, we are all over here, many of you are amateur astronomers, and uh, as I said, today is the amateur astronomy chapter. So I, I've always been feeling that one should do something special here, 
in terms of cerebral science. Right? So because we should take up, uh, just like all the people are working on programs which are here <coughs> done in India, uh, we could simply start a cerebral science program of the kind which is done somewhere else, or we could start something new. So I was talking to my colleagues from persistent systems this morning, and who have set up a research and development way. And what we would like to do is to really start a really, really serious signal science program. Okay, and uh, there many people will have participate, and people are going to do, do specific things, but on the other hand, we require a lot of help in actually setting it up, developing all the software, um, and then to maintain it and to keep it going over the years. Right? So that will be, I believe, a very exciting new development about which you should be hearing uh, quite soon. Okay, uh, good evening. So I'll take a few minutes to talk about the importance of software uh, in astronomical research. So one of the first uh, important things uh, you must realize in astronomy is that there is a lot of data that we need to deal with. So you have images, you have spectra, and then you do all kinds of complicated analysis on these images and spectra, and what you end up with is a table of various properties of that object. Now, once we have the data, it doesn't stop there. We publish it. And then it's not necessarily that from a given a piece of data, I have extracted every bit of science from it. So somebody else has an idea. They need my data, and they ask me for it. Now, the problem is that let's imagine that there are 100 astronomers around the world with 10 observatories. And each of them has a very different approach to storing the data, to naming the data, to describing the data, then there's no way that these several astronomers can exchange data between each other. So the situation we are talking about is something like this. We are talking about one very frustrated astronomer trying to master every data service around the world designed in a completely different way. What we want essentially is a method by which there is an intermediary layer between the data services and the astronomer so that with minimal effort, the astronomer is able to uh, obtain all the data he or she needs and analyze it. So you're talking about a happy astronomer and uh, the technology or the, or the concept that allows you to do that is called virtual observatory. So what exactly is virtual observatory? If I had to show just one slide, I would show this. Now this <laughs> looks very complicated, but it's deliberately done so. But if you think about it, what we are talking about is astronomers at the top, the data at the bottom, and in the middle we have the VO machinery or engine or uh, standards. So what we are talking about is a, a deep collaboration between computer scientists, between computer scientists and astronomers helping each other out to construct a machinery by which data exchange and access can be made smoother. Now this is a pure interdisciplinary work. There's no way an astronomer is going to do all of this and no way a computer scientist can do this alone. It's always uh, in tandem with each other. Okay. Now as a part of the uh, routine for uh, people working with astronomical data, there's a lot of analysis one has to do. And analysis usually implies that you will have to repeat several steps many times because each time you will find that, look, something went wrong, I have to redo it again. Now, if you were to do all that manually, that leads to a lot of pain. And uh, the claim that Varun made that it's fun disappears. So what you need is a method to automate all these processes. And that makes astronomy really fun. And to automate, you need scripting languages. Uh, and uh, with languages that you can use to make pipelines. So Python is currently uh, one of the most powerful languages out there for doing this. And people also use Bash and Perl and other languages to achieve this. One example of the what do you mean by analysis is this. Here I'm showing you an image of a very far off galaxy. And what I'm doing is trying to describe its light distribution using a mathematical model. And then I can study what's left behind after subtracting this from this so that I can either assess the limits of my model or I can understand something hidden within the galaxy and so on. Now, to produce these six plots, the number of steps I would have to do per galaxy is of the order of 40 or 50 steps. 
And if one step goes wrong, I have to go back and redo all 40, 50 steps. But using a pipeline, and this is something that was done here in Ayuka by one of Professor Kembhavi's students. Uh, he wrote a pipeline called PyMoff, and that allows you to do uh, this kind of analysis for hundreds of thousands of galaxies in a matter of days. Okay. So let's, the other important technology that is becoming very relevant in astronomy research is uh, database management. So we have lots of telescopes, this is the Paloma 48, and what, hap what these telescopes are doing is that they visit uh, various regions of the sky repeatedly so that they have brightness comparisons across time to see if some sources have changed their brightness. Now these telescopes are in a week able to gather data that can fill up your entire computer hard drive. So you're talking about enormous amounts of data, very large databases of the order of terabytes and in the future petabytes. And the conventional database methodology will just not do. We need uh, astronomers and computer science people to actually work together and come up with <coughs> solutions that can handle such large data. Then there are other applications of software programming in astronomy. Now, all of you at uh, various levels of schooling and bachelors and masters, you would have solved equations and all of the equations are by design solvable. So it is that, for, it is that conventional stage that in BSc you think I know something, in masters you think you know everything. And when you come to PhD, you realize you know nothing. Because almost every equation out there doesn't have a simple analytical solution, and you need computers to help you find the solution. So that's where languages like Python, Fortran, or MATLAB will help you immensely. And, the and Hamsa showed pictures of these simulations, the animations of these simulations. Now those look nice, but the amount of effort you need to do, the number of computations you need to do, to create that simple simulation is immense. And you can't do it with standard computers. So you actually forget about all flowery languages, go back to good old C, C++, but not the ordinary way, but write code which can exploit high performance machines. What do I mean by that? There are computers with 1000, 10,000 cores, not dual core, not quad core, but more than 1000 cores. And you need to write programs that can efficiently communicate with all these scores and do things in what is called a parallel manner. Now, I'll, uh, to give you uh, a flavor of how important software is here, is, here are some results from a survey that was recently conducted. So the first question they asked in the survey for about 1100 astronomers, do you use software? And this pie chart is one of the best pie charts I've seen because it has only one color. Because <laughs> everybody says yes. And that's how software is relevant in uh, research. Now here, there are three colors. When I say others, it means the question being asked is, am I using software that somebody else has already written? Both me, my own means that no, the conventional software doesn't allow me to do what I want. So I actually have to write my own software to achieve some result or to do some analysis and both refers to a combination. I use a little bit of existing and add a lot of my own code to it to achieve what I want. So you see that only, you see the fractions of people who are able to do everything by just using existing software is of the order of 10%. So now you can imagine that it means that 90% astronomers actually have to write immense amount of codes to get through the day and to finish their research. And here is a uh, is a bar chart showing you the over relative use of languages and you can see that the most used language currently is Python and followed by shell programming and IDL. And uh, when I meet many uh, MSc students who come here and they are saying uh, we are made to learn that boring Fortran Sadawa old language. But you see how frequently it is used because for numerical computations it's the best out there still despite being more than three decades old and same goes with C++ and C. So that's all I have to say and then I'll conclude with this important statement for those of you aspiring to become astronomers that good software drives great astrophysics. Thank you.
I wish to ask that uh, as a part of it, like for an uh, further studies, what part of astronomy should I aspire? Like, uh, should I uh, go for dark matter or uh, such fields which are like tough, or should I start with the easier or rather uh, well-known fields like galaxies and interstellar mediums and like that, the cosmology and stuff? What should no, I? I don't think you need to worry about that now, uh, because uh, you first need to get admission. <laughs> yeah. so you have been hearing what happens to the IIT guys, okay, there is a lot of discussion going on. So, concentrate upon deciding uh, what can, you should have some idea about what you want to do, but that can change drastically. And so, you have to get into a good place, it is very complicated. Uh, you have to pass exams, you have to get good marks. And after that, you will have graduate studies for a year, you will take courses, you think you should be exposed to all kinds of subjects. And then you can uh, decide what you want. And so it is, uh, uh, it is not something which you can decide for yourself right in the beginning and then go into it. I mean, some people do that, but it is best to keep that is actually right. But some universities are like specific fields. Like some universities are good in like this field, right? Yes. And some are in this field. Yes. So, then so what happens is that uh, that is true in the sense that there may be some uh, place may be very famous in cosmology. Again, okay, other places may be concentrating on uh, other kinds of astrophysics. Uh, but if you go to a large university, there will be enough subjects. At IUCAR, we don't do all subjects. But we have got a pretty good spread of uh, astrophysics. If you go to NCR, they are mainly radio astronomers. But that doesn't mean that they don't have people working on non radio astronomy topics. But if you want to do radio astronomy specifically, that is the place to go to. Whereas there are several people who have stayed in IUCAR and radio astronomy. Right, and then, uh, so it all is a matter of detail. Hello, sir. Uh, I am in uh, BSMS uh, first year in the ISA Pune. Uh, I just joined uh, uh, in this week uh, you know, on the 3rd of August. Uh, my question is about uh, internships. Does internships really help you help you getting the jobs and uh, doing your research work? Uh, yes, I mean, I can't see not having internship at all. Okay, because you need to go to institutes, you need to be exposed to the thing, you need to see what is the research. But because you may have to decide that you don't like that kind of thing. Right? Because reality can be quite different from your image. Uh, so you must go to different places and go to Internships are very important. Thank you. Uh, the presentation was very good. Uh, I would like to ask that uh, you have just mentioned that after uh, completion of engineering, uh, we can directly apply for uh, postgraduate in astronomy. Actually, I want to ask that uh, uh, which are the good uh, universities according to you that uh, they can offer me that PhD because uh, even I'm integrated in this I mean, universities in India, universities outside India? Not in India. In India, you see that uh, what happens is that there are universities where you can do a good PhD, but uh, the concentration of work in astronomy is mainly the institute. Okay, so like if I have institutes, I mean places like I But if you look at university, then you've got Delhi University, you've got Alibaba University, you've got Kapita University, there are so many universities where you could do as well. Right? So what you need to do is to get a good scholarship. And you can do that by applying for the next exam. Right? So, but there are also all kinds of other avenues for getting scholarships. So um, you get a scholarship, then you can carry it with you. If you get a next scholarship, you can take it wherever you want. Okay, so if you come to a place like NCR, you don't have to pass the exam because they give their own scholarship. Because are you guys in the university sector, we can we pass, expect you to pass the exam. Right? So there, 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 there's plenty of choice. And as I said, you talk to people, you can come here, you can talk to that student who just joined. Or the, you can look at the net. And you can look at individual institutional websites, university websites, and you get quite a lot of information. 